semantics is about the study of literal meaning. And there's two different subfields of semantics that are usually investigated. One is truth conditional semantics, which is very mathematical. It is about determining how you can figure out the truth of a sentence depending on the meaning of its parts. We are not going to focus on truth conditional semantics. Instead, we'll focus on lexical semantics, which is about word and phrase meanings and their different properties. So just an example of what truth conditional semantics is like. Imagine we have a sentence like Sam saw a movie. We need to transform it into a logical notation. And then using that logical notation, we motivate a tree structure where every single node on a tree has a meaning and they combine in certain ways to get new meanings. So this is very technical. We don't really have time to explain it. I do have videos on semantics on the Trev Tutor YouTube channel. If you are interested, there's a full playlist. Um, but for intro linguistics, typically this stuff is not taught. So we'll start with thematic roles. Now, when we have verbs like intransitive, transitive, or ditransitive verbs, there are certain relationships that the verb has with its subject, object, and potentially indirect object. For example, when you have a verb like kicks, you need a kicker and you need a kick e, and there's certain requirements for the kickers and the kick e's. For example, kickers have to be agents. They have to be things that can actually kick, and kick e's just need to be things that can be kicked. In the case of loves, you need a lover and a lovey. And for a sitter, well, if you have sits, you're going to need a sitter. So we can ask ourselves, why does this sentence sound odd? The small train loves chocolate. Well, that's because in a case of loves, we, we need something animate, typically, unless we're using it in a metaphorical use. But in terms of literal meaning, it doesn't make sense to say the small train loves chocolate. So we don't want to say it's ungrammatical because it follows all of our syntactic rules, but we do want to say that there's some weird semantic violation happening here. And that's because we expect a certain type of subject to exist. So these are the different thematic roles that we can assign to NPs. The first one is an agent. So these are things that intentionally perform actions. Typically, they're at the beginning of a sentence as a subject, but they can be in a passive by phrase as well. So for Winnie fought the bear, Winnie is an agent because Winnie is the thing that can initiate the action of fighting. In the case of Albert Einstein ate four apples a day, we have our eater, Albert Einstein, who can initiate the action of eating. Now, experiencers can also exist as subjects. So when we say Charles felt sad about his discovery, Charles here is an experiencer. And we say he's an experiencer because a feeling is not something that you actively do. You don't intentionally perform a feeling. When you feel sad, you simply experience that emotion or you experience that action. For Spider-Man sensed a bad feeling, same thing here. We have an experiencer rather than an agent because when you sense something, that's not something you actively do. That's not something you actively initiate. This is an experience of that action of sensing. So when you think about agents or experiencers, don't just think subjects. You need to think about the actual meaning of what the verb is looking for. Now, theme is the general argument for things that are affected by actions. Usually direct objects are themes, and that's pretty set in stone for like most cases you'll encounter. So for I push the boulder with all my might, the boulder is the thing that is being pushed. This is the theme. Dr. Oz considered real science an enemy. The thing you're considering is the theme in this case. So real science. Now, we also have benefactives, which appear in indirect object positions. So the entity that benefits from an action, I have a package for you. So uh, in terms of giving something, you give a theme to a recipient or benefactive. You might also see recipient, some books distinguish between the two, some don't. Uh, if there is a distinction between the two, you can think of recipients as being after two and benefactives as being after four. So he wiped the tables clean for us. The wiping the tables is done for a purpose for someone, which is us in this case. So us would be the benefactive of this. Now, in terms of direction and location, we have source and goal. So source and goal are kind of like opposites of each other. So sources are where things are coming from, where the action is coming from, and goals are where the action is going. So when we say I traveled from Spain to Italy, 
from Spain. Spain, in this case, is the source. That's where you're coming from. And to Italy, Italy is the goal. That's where you're headed. Uh, I walked from the bookstore to get here. So we're walking from a location. We're walking from a source. And I gave the ointment to Dandruff Dan. Well, uh, in this case, Dandruff Dan is the thing that is being transferred to. It might even be better in this case to call it a recipient rather than a goal. So the last one we'll talk about is instrument, and this is what you perform an action with. So I slash the body up with an axe. So an axe is the tool you're using in this case, or I made a cake with several indeterminate ingredients. In this case as well, this is the tool that you're using in order to make a cake. So when we have a verb in a particular context, we can create what's called a thematic grid. And what this does is this lists the thematic roles in order from left to right that you see them in a sentence. So for example, in dive, we can need an agent. So the puppy dove is an example. For the case of devour, we need an agent and a theme. We need a subject and object. We see the agent first, which is a big monster, then the verb devoured, and then the kid is a theme. For the case of give and borrow, we need different things here. So agent, theme, and then we either want to say goal or probably better is a recipient in this case. So Susie gave a bucket to Charlie. They're occurring in that order. And for borrow, we need an agent and a theme, but we also include a source in this case because it is coming from someone. So whenever we have a verb in a particular context, we can assign it theta roles. So let's make thematic grids for each of these verbs. So bought, sent, and fixed. So in the case of bought, Bot requires a buyer and a buyee. It requires an agent and requires a theme. So we can say that the theta grid for this is agent and then theme. Okay, what about an Harry sent a carrier pigeon to Hogwarts? Okay, we need a sender, which is an agent. We need a theme, which is the thing being sent. And then we need a goal because that is where it's going. So for the theta grid for this, we would have agent theme and then also our goal afterwards. Okay, finally, CJ fixed my computer for me. CJ would be an agent in this case, is fixing something which is a theme, and who's it for? It's for me, so this is a benefactive. So we would have an agent, a theme, and then we'd have the benefactive after that. So you'll notice that a lot of transitive verbs in English are agent theme or experiencer theme. Uh, that's just generally how verbs select their requirements for subjects and objects. Now let's talk about some word relations. So we say that two words are homonyms if they have different meanings, but either the same pronunciation or same spelling. If it's the same pronunciation, then we call them homophones, homo just meaning same, and then phones meaning sound, and then homographs, uh, homo again meaning uh, same, and then graphs just meaning the way that we write things down. So you can think of it as writing. So same sound versus same writing. So some examples of just homophones are two and two, as in the number two and as well. You can see they're pronounced exactly the same, but they are spelled differently. In the case of homographs, tear and tear are spelled the same, but their pronunciation is different. So that's why we call these homographs. Now it is possible to have both. So in band and band, they're both being pronounced the exact same way, but they have two different meanings. One where we have a musician and one where a band is like a thin, a thin material, like a rubber band, for example. Synonymy and antonymy are probably ones that you've learned very young. Two words are synonyms if they have almost the same meaning. It's very rare to have something that is completely synonymous because usually we pick words depending on the context or even the style that we're speaking in. So two synonyms could be like happy and joyful. They might have slightly different connotations and when they're used and how they're used, but they're close enough. Same with smart and intelligent. I think there's a difference between smart and intelligent, but the concept is pretty similar. So these are as close to synonyms as we're going to get. And antonyms are just opposite meanings. So happy and sad, smart and dumb, hot and cold. Uh, these ones, I'm, I'm pretty sure you know these. What you might not know is hyponymy. So we have hypernyms and hyponyms, and this is about the relationship between generality and specific. So for example, if we take a look at the chart over here on the right, 
A plant is a category that holds things like flowers as well as other things like, I don't know, a bush, for example. And then flowers are things that is a more general category of specific items like crocus, rose, begonia, daffodil, and so on. So the relationship we're talking about is the relationship between the specific one and the general one. So we say the specific one is a hyponym of the general one. So for example, cat is a hyponym of animal because cat is a type of animal. Computer is a hyponym of technology because a computer is a type of technology. So when you think of hyponyms, you can just think of a similar rephrasal, which is just like a type of. Now, hypernyms are just the opposite direction. Hypernym would be like a more general case. So human is a hypernym of child. Human is a more general case than child. Child would be a young human. And color is a hypernym of red. Now, whenever you have a hyponym, you can always reverse the order to make a hypernym relationship. So we just call this hyponymy in general. The last one is meronymy. So this is one I, that I'd never heard of before I took a linguistics course. And this is the a part of relationship, as in a component of something. So this isn't about the general or specificity of it. This is whether or not an individual thing is the part of a whole. So in the right, we have a car diagram, and we can say some things about car. So for example, wheel is a meronym of car. In other words, wheel is a part of a car. Your eye is a part of your face, so we say eye is a meronym of face. Petal would be a meronym of rose, because roses have petals, and leg would be a meronym of dog, as well as human, as well as cat, and a bunch of different things, because legs are a component of what makes up uh, a living mammal, for the most part. So let's take a look at these and figure out which type of relationship exists between each word. So with course and course, these are pronounced the same, but they're spelled differently. So they have the same pronunciation, which means that this is a homophone specifically for same sound. Uh, we could just say it's not homonymy in general, but we can be specific, so why not? What about coarse and fine? So something is very rough versus something is more fine. These are antonyms. So this is antonymy. What about the enter key in a keyboard? Well, if we draw a keyboard, we have a bunch of different buttons, and then we have our little enter key. Sometimes the enter key doesn't look like that. <laughs> sometimes it just looks like a straight bar, and sometimes it looks like a vertical bar. This is definitely an older style keyboard than I'm used to, and I visualize in my head. So an enter key is a part of a keyboard, so this is meronymy. Okay, lastly, sadness and emotion. Well, sadness is a type of emotion, Therefore, this is going to be hyponymy, because when we think about what emotions are, they encapture a lot of different types, and sadness is one of those types.